The purpose of the interview today is really just to talk about your experience in public management, in public management, which I'm sure Professor Kettle maybe briefed you on a little bit. Um, and so specifically, we're excited to kind of hear about how you manage challenges within the IRS and how you coordinate with external federal agencies as well as coordinate with Congress and um, how you implement strategies to kind of improve accountability here at the IRS. Does that sound? Sounds like a deal. <laughs> All right, awesome. Okay, so I'm going to start off with the questions, um, and we'll just be capturing some notes, but this is just going to be like a casual dialogue. <laughs> All right. um, so when you transitioned into your role as the commissioner in 2013, it was obviously a time of kind of heightened scrutiny. Um, so what were some of the most important steps you took to address both the internal management challenges here at the IRS, while at the same time navigating that external controversy with the, you know, 501c4. 501c4. <laughs> so one of my uh, theories of management is if you want to know what's uh, going on in an organization, just go talk to the people doing the work. Mm -hmm. That's not my importance. So as I've said on several occasions, I <clears throat> announced that I wanted to go to the IR visit the IRS offices, and was told there were over 500. At which point I said I'd like to go visit some of the IRS. <laughs> yeah. So I went to uh, two cities a week for three and a half months, uh, holding town halls with frontline employees and a town hall with managers, mm -hmm. lunch with randomly selected employees, and a meeting with the union leadership as well. Uh, and it was, I did it not just to make people feel good, that while the commissioners there, although I would guess, judging on comments, 80 to 90 percent of the people had never seen their IRS commissioner before. Right. Uh, but it was really to learn from them right. uh, what was going on, what their challenges were, what the problems were, and to some extent to get a feel for what the uh, state of morale was. And it was surprising to me, and it's a tribute to the workforce and the dedication of employers to their work, that I expected <coughs> I would hear about pay freezes and um, uh, overwork and all mm -hmm. the rest of it. And instead what I heard was uh, repetitively concerns about the lack of resources and the impact it had on the ability of employees to provide the services to taxpayers they thought they needed or to be able to collect the uh, revenues that we were leaving on the table because we were shrinking as a result of the budget cuts. The I now continue to do town halls, do some of them virtually, some in person, so I by count because I'm a numbers guy. Mm -hmm. uh, I now uh, talked with and listened to over 20,000 IRS employees. Wow. Uh, and so part of that is to encourage them to feel comfortable that we need to hear from them when there are problems, issues, when they've got uh, suggestions. So part of the challenge is to get information to flow from the bottom up as well as the top down. And to the extent that uh, people feel that their opinions and insights are valued, they feel better about their work and more enthusiastic about it. But it's in a context where, as I say, uh, there was an amazing, and still is, an amazing amount of energy and enthusiasm for the work among a workforce that you would expect would be dispirited and uh, you know, totally uh, unhappy about it. I mean, it's not a great situation. Yeah. Uh, but one of the other things we've tried to do uh, over this time frame is to be transparent mm -hmm. uh, with the employees, to give them all the information I have. So when we went through the 15 budget process, we shared right. with the employees what was happening, what the impact was going to be. And again, people generally, whether they're in a government agency or not, feel better about things if you know what's going on, and then when you have to wonder, wonder what they're talking about in that right. room and what's it going to mean for me. Um, because one of the issues uh, in uh, this is managers need to know at least as much as their employees know, and when right. they need to know hopefully a little more detail so when employees have questions, the managers are comfortable answering them. Mm -hmm. uh, so anyway, that's a theory internally, externally. Um, you know, I've been, I've not had probably over 40 hearings. Yeah. Uh, many of them, uh, many, 80 80% of them with people yelling at me. Uh, so there, my strategy has been to, again, be transparent and candid, but basically my style is, I'm a smiley, cheery guy, but yeah. uh, pushing back. Mm. Uh, and I think one of the things that has helped the employees uh, morale, although I didn't do it for that reason, but is I've been very, uh, in my speeches as well, this is more about touting, because I really believe it, uh, the ability and uh, capacity of the workforce. Uh, they produce, as I keep telling people, we produce much more than anybody has a right to expect with everything right. that's going on, including having 15,000 fewer of them. And apparently nobody has regularly talked about how good the IRS employees are to the public and the Congress or the press for some time. So they've appreciated that. And I've 
disagreed, therefore, with characterizations or assertions by various congressional uh, members mm -hmm. uh, in hearings where they will make a comment, and I will actually go out of my way to explain why that's not quite accurate. Yeah. Uh, why I used it as there. But my overall strategy, the C4 issue was a critical problem, not only because it got sort of distorted, but on right. the heart of it, it was a significant problem. At a minimum, organizations were waiting a couple of years to get an answer to their applications. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the ironies that never got reported is they all could have been, c force can go out and operate on their own. They don't need uh, a determination from the IRS. So all of these people who were waiting could have actually gone out and done whatever they wanted to do. Uh, I think the reason they were hoping to get a determination was because they were going to be involved in political activity and wanted to be able to have defined with us what they were going to do so we wouldn't second guess them later on and uh, disenfranchise them. Because the concern uh, was that it affected uh, the claims that we were discriminating against people targeting them. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, goes to the heart of fairness in the system. Uh, as I, even with our limited resources, we still do a million audits a year. Wow. And so, as I've said, it's important for the public to understand if you get audited, it's not because you're a Democrat or Republican, you know who you voted for in the last election, what meeting you were at three weeks ago. Uh, if you hear from us and you get audited, it's because of something in your tax return, and somebody else right. with that same issue would also have the same uh, response from us. So, to the extent that, on the hill, even today, uh, to this time, three years later, people are saying that the IRS was politicized, it was actually not mm -hmm. looking at things on the merits. Uh, that's corrosive to the entire mm -hmm. voluntary compliance system. So it was important to actually let people know we took it seriously, uh, that we were in fact taking all the recommendations of the IG. Uh, last summer, uh, the Senate Finance Committee issued a bipartisan report, over 300 pages, and we uh, so when I told the staff we went through and looked at all the bipartisan recommendations, then we looked at all the recommendations in the majority report mm -hmm. uh, and in the minority report, and we announced at a hearing that we were last fall that we were going to implement them all. Mm -hmm. So the strategy, there were six investigations going on. We had uh, two in the House, uh, two in the Senate, the Inspector General and the Department of Justice. Uh, producing ultimately a million three hundred thousand pages of documents, spending twenty million dollars to do it, and being yelled at the whole time that we weren't doing it fast right. enough, we were writing yeah. stuff, uh, whatever. Um, so my other strategy externally was that we needed to do whatever we could to cooperate and get information out there, so we could get the investigations concluded. As yeah. I said on a couple times, I almost didn't care what they said in their report, uh, as long as they came to closure and gave us that recommendation so we could move on. Yeah, yeah I think it, my latest strategy, um, you don't do uh, kind of disaster management, crisis management for 45 years without thinking that life is going to get better. Yeah. <laughs> so we're always moving in the right direction. So my latest theory is that whoever wins the next election, Come January, people will be looking at what are we going to do going forward, and that will be the discussion and the focus. Uh, this issue was already three years old. By that time, it will be headed to being four years old, and my hope is it will be in the background. Right. So, in your interview with Willie Hoffman regarding um, tax analysis, um, you stated that the structure, leadership, and resources are the best aspects of any agency. How has your work within the IRS reinforced this vision? And which one of these components do you view as the most important? Uh, let's see, structure? So structure, leadership, and resources. <laughs> and you, <laughs> okay. you hit on the resources. Yeah, so the resources, you know, it's hard. You can't say, well, I, you know, if I have really great resources and, uh, uh, you know, not great leadership, I'm going to waste them on. Mm -hmm. uh, so probably, you know, in any organization, what you need is obviously uh, an appropriate workforce uh, yeah. with, with appropriate leadership. So as I've said uh, numerous times internally, if you looked at all of the stuff we do, we have criminal investigations, we get other people all over the world, et cetera, and you look at the divisions and the operations, the most critical division in this organization is the human capital organization. Mm -hmm. Because as I tell everybody, if we can't recruit people appropriately, train them well, and develop them and provide them support and the equipment and work, uh, resources they need to do their job, the mm -hmm. rest of it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it really starts with people. Then you have to give them uh, an appropriate structure. And we are an organization that is appropriately risk averse in the sense that we know we touch 150 million Americans every year, a right, million families. Um, so anything we do ripples through the system. So, you know, you just, 
to be careful. So, and taxpayers ought to get the same answer wherever they interface with the system, whether they're in California, New York, or in South Carolina. So you need to have process and procedures. The art form is not to get trapped by them. So you have to be able to be flexible and be able to respond uh, to the reality that's happening out there, which is, again, why you want to hear from employees what's going on as you go. But then it all goes. The structure goes all to the issue of, we talked earlier about how it functions. And if it's a command and control structure, in my experience is it won't work. And that's not a government or a private sector issue. It just, I don't think, works. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I used to have a long debate with a guy in the Congressional Revenue Service uh, uh, reference, or uh, research, what is CRS? Anyway, research or <laughs> reference service on the Hill about the difference in management in the private sector and the public sector. Yeah. And my position is a general matter, there's not much. Mm. That if you're running an organization, you have the same problems with recruitment, training, resources, how you actually run the place. Obviously, in the private sector, as everybody says, you got a bottom line, so you can measure your sex success more directly. Uh, and as I've said in the public sector, in the private sector, you have to really do something terrible to get on the uh, front page of the Wall Street Journal. Right. In the public sector, uh, almost anything you do that doesn't work yeah. exactly right is going to get you somewhere in the Wall Street Journal. Right. So the pressure yeah. uh, is much greater on a manager in the public sector than in the private sector. So it's easier to run a company than it is to run a department. Mm -hmm. uh, besides the fact that the federal departments are huge and much bigger. You know. <clears throat> We're down to 85,000 people, but that's still a lot more people than most companies uh, yeah. uh, have. So you've got to have an appropriate uh, structure and function as to how the place runs. And then you have to have the resources. I mean, at yeah. some point you are, uh, what we've just established this year, is if, you, if you don't give us the money, we can't hire the people, there won't be anybody to answer the phone. So this year <laughs> people gave us more money, and so we hired more people. <laughs> and as a result, we had more people to answer the phone. So the level of Taxpayer service on the phones went from 37% to over 70% as a direct correlation of just resources. So you put them all together and uh, yeah. that's what you need. Great, thank you. So, as an, in closing, I'm I know. Well, that's right. I, my uh, group said, okay, well, when do we really throw them out? <laughs> <laughs> we'll throw you out in about 15 minutes. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Okay. I mean, well, we'll ask this question and then. Uh, yes. follow up. So, in closing, ref on, as you reflect on your time in public sector management and the highs and lows that you, <laughs> many that you've described, what would you say are key le leadership lessons that you would want us to learn as we're early on in our careers as you reflect on this entire journey you've been on? Key lessons. Well, it's a, uh, it's a good question. It really goes back a lot of it that we've talked about. I mean, I think. <coughs> uh, one is that you ought to make sure there are lines of communication always open to the people actually doing the work. Mm -hmm. And it's not only to get their information and their perspectives. Um, we created an enterprise risk management <coughs> organization. Danny actually has set the concept up and then we've implemented it over the last two and a half years. Uh, and it's not because the agency wasn't aware of risk. We've always looked at risk. What a risk management organization allows you to do is you regularly review, collect those risks, prioritize them, and review them, because otherwise people say something happens, you say, you know, I knew that was a problem. We talked about it a year ago or two years ago. But for that to work as well, as I've told the employees, every employee has to view themselves as a risk manager. Mm -hmm. Every employee has to view it as their not only uh, responsibility, but obligation to raise their hand when there's a problem. Yeah. Now, to do that, you have to get employees to believe that bad news is good news, mm -hmm. and that the only problem you can't solve is the problem you don't know about. Mm -hmm. Because in most organizations, bad news is not good news, and the temptation is to hide or hope nobody notices. And I, as I tell people, most problems don't get better with age. Uh, <laughs> they get worse, they get harder, which is why I am a big supporter of internal auditors, the Inspector General, and GAO. Um, and I thought that way in the private sector as well, because as I tell people, the IG doesn't create the problem. The IG just discovers it before it gets worse. And if you deal with them effectively, they'll find things that you should know about and you'll fix them. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, the fact that half the time they're on the front page of some uh, paper or you get yeah. to have a hearing about it shouldn't detract from the importance of the function uh, as you go. So you need to have an organization where, as I say, if there's a problem, that's my problem and we'll fix it. If somebody's made a mistake, it's my mistake and uh, we'll remedy it. So as I said, much confirmation hearing, it would be, some people would say, well, the goal is to have no problems, make no mistakes. As I've said, if you have 85,000 employees, the world's most complicated tax code, and you're dealing with 150 million American families, yeah. 
the chances of that are zero. So the better goal is to say if there's a problem, we'll find it quickly, we'll fix it quickly, and we'll be transparent about it. And there are several wonderful examples of how that's worked for us positively, where we had a problem, suddenly made a mistake, we fixed it quickly, and we were transparent about it, and as a result, nobody said boo, because if you have, even if you're just in the process of fixing it, if you found the problem, you're fixing it, and you're talking to people about it, it's not very exciting. Yeah. What's exciting is when somebody else finds the problem, and you haven't started to fix it. Yeah. And then two things happen. One is, not only do you get yelled at about that, but then yeah. you've lost credibility because people say, well, what else is going on? Either you don't know about it or you're not telling us. Right. So to the extent, ironically, you talk about the problems you've found and you're fixing, you get more credibility as being in control and in managing the place well because you are actually fixing problems and talking about them as you go. So the uh, so it's kind of intuitive in a lot of ways, which is why in the private sector and the public sector, if there's a problem, people try to figure out how to hide it or how do I avoid it or how can I blame somebody else. Yeah. Instead of just saying, here's the problem, okay, we shouldn't have done it, it was a mistake, I hope we don't do it again, but let's fix it. Right. You also have to fight the problem in the uh, public sector, uh, that if there is a problem or a mistake, the first question is, who's going to get fired? Mm -hmm. And the first answer to that is, maybe nobody. Mm -hmm. When I was the deputy mayor and city administrator for Washington, running the mm -hmm. city, when I left after three years, the only thing the Washington Post could find to say negatively um, in an otherwise positive article was I hadn't fired enough people. And I thought, okay, if that's the worst thing anybody can say about my tenure is I didn't fire enough people, uh, that's okay. But there is a natural pressure, and I get it all the time on the other. Well, you know, okay, who's been held accountable? And accountable is the same as, you know, who'd you shoot? You know, it's not accountable because you gave them a reprimand, you put uh, in a file, you gave them three days or five days without pay. Accountable is synonymous with fire. Uh, and what happens, of course, is to the extent you actually respond to that pressure. Uh, in effect, you drive everybody on the ground because everybody, you know, it's harder to raise your hand and say, hey, I made a mistake if you think the result is everybody's going to try to figure out how to hold you accountable as opposed to how to fix it. Right. Uh, so, as I say, you know, we'd rather not, not have people make the same mistake more than once, but if you're, my feeling always has been, if you're making a mistake in a good faith effort to do your job, we all do that. And so the real question is, uh, what I want to do is know about it so we can fix it. Yeah. The challenge in all of this is the is managers, not the frontline employees, but it's managers because when you get to be the manager, you get promoted, you tend to think, okay, and you think everybody thinks, well, now I get paid the big bucks because I know the yeah. answers. So I should, in my meetings, have meetings to tell people what to do, not to get their input into it. Because if I ask you, well, what's your idea? You're going to say, well, you know, you're the manager, uh, you get paid. I mean, if you have to ask me, why am I not the manager? Right. And so there's an instinctive hesitation and a feeling on people, particularly new managers, but even middle-level managers, that, well, I shouldn't ask anybody because it'll be a sign of weakness. My experience in 45 years is I have never heard an employee say, well, why do you have to ask me? You should not. Because every employee is so delighted to be able to be asked what they think and to have somebody mm -hmm. listen to it that they are pleased and delighted with the whole process. Yeah. Uh, as you go. So anyway, those are my management <laughs> strategies for um, getting ahead in the world. So, it's so great because you hit on so many of the themes that you've kind of been talking about in class this semester, so it's really, really yeah. just awesome to hear your insight.